All right. I'd like to call this um, presentation meeting to order. Today is February 21st at 6.30, Town of Southington, Board of Finance. And this is a meeting where we're going to hear budget presentations from the town clerk, the building department, the library and Barnes Museum, and lastly, the police department. So we thank everybody for coming, and we hope that you know the public gets as much out of this as we do as on the Board of Finance. Uh, probably one of the more popular uh, video recordings we do is of these presentations this week and next week. And uh, this is how we invite other people into the conversation. So. Let's start with the uh, town clerk department. Okay, I'm going to tell you um, a little bit about what we do in the town clerk's office. We have a lot of varied, varied duties. Um, as you know, land records is our um, revenue producing portion. Uh, we record land records, uh, survey maps. Our land record um, information is also shared with the assessor, assessors and tax department for their um, purposes and building department as well so they can see what's coming um, down the line. Uh, we are also um, Another big thing is elections. We are the department that prepares the ballot for the elections, for local elections. State and federal uh, ballots are prepared by the Secretary of State. Uh, we issue absentee ballots. Um, we start that in October um, through to the election time. We work along with the registrars um, through that whole time. Uh, this year, um, the state it was voted on that we will have early voting and the state of Connecticut is working on that and will be implemented I believe this this coming election the local election so that will work to wait and see to see how that is going to affect our uh, absentee balloting with the early voting we are also the registrar of vital statistics we maintain the records for birth marriages and deaths issuing certified copies um, the deaths, we also provide an index to other departments so that they can maintain their records, which is assessment and tax, uh, register our voters, and calendar house. Um, we issue marriage licenses for individuals being married in the town of Southington. Come May, we're going to be starting with our uh, dog licensing season um, that mainly goes through uh, July and kind of tapers off for it for the rest of the year. We also issue um, hunting and fishing licenses. It's a state system that is used, and we log on through the state system to issue these to the residents. It is something that, that is also available to people online, but a lot of people still like to come to us for that uh, personal service. We are the keeper of the records for the town. Uh, town clerks are known for being the keeper of the records. We um, have all the agendas and minutes for boards and commissions. And we maintain the uh, website as far as posting those uh, minutes and agendas. Other things that we maintain the lists of boards and commissions and ele elected officials, those are then also posted on our website. We file liquor permits, trade names. Trade names are uh, also given to the assessor's office. Veterans DD-214s, those are also shared with the assessor's office for benefits for those individuals. Workmen's comp claims, those are then transferred to HR along with Kerma and um, the attorney. Um, we file lawsuits uh, with our office. We then turn those over to the Corporation Council for them to act on. And the town clerk is responsible for uh, records retention. We're the liaison for the towns. We have two records rooms in the town hall here. Uh, where our records are stored. We assist the depart other departments with their um, retention schedules and guide them as to um, 
their storage. Uh, once we have, there is approval for records to be destroyed, permission has to be granted by the state of Connecticut. And then once that has happened, then we arrange for those um, documents, whatever they may be, to be picked up, or we have shredding bins for smaller, smaller loads of those. Um, and I'm sure there's things that I'm missing. We do so many varied things, but uh, we also are the place to call when someone doesn't know where else to call. So we are always trying to um, help those people as best we can. If you have any questions about our our department, and you generate revenue, and we generate <laughs> revenue. Um, sorry, the the early voting. So the potential cost for that is not in this budget. Is that correct? That would be under the registrar of voters. Registrar, right. Okay. Secondly, um, uh, just a quick thing: the the temporary wages. You know, obviously we're used to a smaller amount, and it's gone up. What's the reason for that? Over the past few years, because we had gotten so busy, some of our, um, I'll call it busy work, had gotten behind. Oh. So we were having someone come in and assist us, catching up us, catching us up on those types of things. Okay. It's not a lot, but <laughs> okay. You have a question as well. Sorry, I have a question as well. Um, I know you have notary services. Are they available during all open office hours? They are. And is there a charge for that? We um, first two signatures, two notary signatures. There's no charge if it. We've been getting a lot of large uh, mortgage type packages over two signatures. We we charge a dollar each. Thank you very much. I know that there have been people online looking for notary services and. It's nice to know that it is available there. Thank you. You're welcome. If I can just make a comment. Uh, this is going to be happening, all the budgets that you read, uh, but for the uh, people at home, when they look at the, the wages, you're going to see it says a 4.2% increase. There's a reason for that. I know you know that, but the general public may not know it. Um, because this is a contract that ran out uh, June 30th of last year, it has two years' worth of raises in it. So the raises that are for this fiscal year and for next fiscal year. So when you see 4.2%, the first thing someone's going to say is everyone got a 4.2% raise. That is not correct. That's for two fiscal years. And it was offset last year in the contingency. Yeah, the money was always in contingency. Always so, there. Yeah. It's usually the question I get. So I just want to make oh, sure that everyone yeah. who's watching this understands that. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. Okay. I'm cool. Okay. Well, thank you very much. All right. You're welcome. You being here thank you. Telling us about all that, all that you do, Mr. Bose. If you could tell us the page number and the document for each department as they come up, it would be helpful. Uh, do you have a? Yep. I'm sorry. You have an index right there, right in the front. Yeah, it's hard to find. I know. You know uh, where it is, it's, it's hard to find. You tell us. It's helpful. All right. I I shall do that. I think now we have Mr. Pooler, uh, and Mr. Pooler is on page. Uh, boy, this is small. Looks like yeah. page 100 to 101. <laughs> I'm, I'm older than you are. <laughs> try, try to 100 to 101. Get tabs, we're saving money. <laughs> Thank you. Ask for them every year. Tabs come in the final budget, not yours. <laughs> Just the one we work with, though, the final one. We, we don't mark it up. Hi, good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm Jeff Pooler from the building department. Um, our department handles pretty much everything building. Uh, Last year, we took in 4,654 applications, reviewed them for uh, code compliance, and issued building permits accordingly. Uh, then we go out on inspections. Last year, we performed uh, 8,086 inspections. Um, on top of the inspections and permitting process, we do assist other departments, like the health department, fire department, police department on occasion. Um, when they have any type of building related issue, um, we do uh, supply, uh, supply information for FOIA requests on building related information. Um, we do retain records, uh, the commercial properties uh, we are required by the state to maintain forever. Uh, so we do house those uh, down in the department and we have those on file. Uh, we have an online system um, which now has both residential and commercial information readily available to the public. We actually do provide notary services as well. We have three uh, public notaries in our department. So 
if for some reason um, Kathy's department can't get to you, we can always help you out as well. Good to know. Okay. Um, quick um, question. Um, the overtime pay. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, this year spent a lot of money on that, right? Yeah. And you don't intend to next year. Is that inspections? Everything going down? Is last year we are uh, the primary reason for for our overtime was we had uh, some staffing issues, and oh, in order to cover right. the staffing issues, we had um, additional monies were allocated towards the overtime to get the work done. Um, this year we're hoping that now that we're fully staffed and everybody's oh. trained, we should be able to maintain a fairly steady line on that. Is there anything you're seeing from an economic perspective that um, the work you're doing is going to gradually tail off? Um, that's kind of hard to say. Uh, we are seeing the residential market slow down a little bit in comparison to the last couple of years. However, the commercial market has picked right up. Um, our economic development department has been telling us to uh, put your seatbelt on because it's going to be a fun ride the next couple of years. So Southington is still very active in the construction area. Um, there's still quite a few large potential projects in the pipeline uh, that are getting closer and closer. So um, I don't know that I could say it's going to slow down but hopefully not. <laughs> so, thank you. I, I don't think so, to be honest with you. It's a very, very popular area and great location to be in, and a lot of people want to be here in Southington. Great, so. thanks. Are you fully staffed now? Yes. Yeah. Jeff, you want to, um, uh, one of the things is, is new initiatives, and I, and I know that you're being very modest, <laughs> but, um, but you and Jay uh, worked on a, uh, an actual permits uh, situation and FOI. I think you need to explain because taking a lot of pressure off your department where we didn't have. Sure. Yeah. About uh, 18 months to two years ago, we started digitizing all of our um, historical paper documents and we've implemented uh, and incorporated them into the online permitting system. So now uh, if a real estate agent or an attorney wants to do a, a FOIA request, they can actually do the research themselves right online. Um, that information is all readily available and, and easily accessed. Uh, what would they find? What would that information be? <sighs> right yeah. now it's, it's holding anything building related. So um, any of the old permits from the 60s, 70s, even, even some of them go back as far as the 50s. We had a company come in, grab the information, and they actually scanned it, identified it, and attached it to the uh, the proper proper parcel. So, um, on the main page of their parcel, they can see all that historic documentation. We it were depends. Hundreds of man hours. Yeah. Because the request would come in, an attorney wants to. And people want to see all old permits. Well, well the, the reason why is because if you if you want to buy a house, and and a mortgage company comes in and says, okay. Uh, you, they hire an attorney to do a search on it or a, or a title agency to do a search on it. Part of that is to check to make sure there's no outstanding building permits or the work that's been done on the, on the house has been done. And it used to be, perfectly blunt, um, we had to hire a half-time person just to go through all that, to go through the, the, the paper documents that we had. So about 18, almost two years ago, yeah. we all sat down and said we're going to put some IT money into something like this because we knew in the long run it was going to benefit us. So. It, yeah, helps, it helps his office because that half-time person now could actually do work for the building department as opposed to doing 100 percent FOI stuff. So, yeah, we were receiving, I want to say, between 30 and 40 FOI requests a month, uh, which is a considerable amount of man hours to dedicate. Um, some of the residential FOIA requests weren't too too bad, but the commercial stuff, um, you know, a lot of the attorneys want to see the entire history and. You know, 750 Queen Street's been around since the 80s, and how many stores have been in, or 70s, and how many stores have been in and out of there. Um, and they want to know if there's any environmental issues or any types of uh, violations that may or may not have occurred. Um, so it, it can be a deep dive on some of those properties. You said earlier you did um, 4,000 permits a year? Last year we processed 4,654 permit applications. With four inspectors? Four inspectors, yeah. So that you inspect every permit, or 
Um, at least, yes, at least once, and depending on what the, the application is for, we may, we may have multiple um, inspections per. So you're so, looking at, if you have four inspectors, about 40 a day, you're out there, you're hustling. Yeah, we are moving. Yeah, and that doesn't include, um, you know, the things that happen, trees through houses, the, the unforeseen things um, that we need to, to participate in as well. Um, anytime that there's a, a, a lightning storm or something like that, one of us is on call and we're going out checking out to make sure that the house is habitable. Who would call for that? The res the owners, the dispatch. usually dispatch, oh, fire fire uh, no. police dispatch. Yep. They're a very very active department. I remember last year, a couple of years ago, there was an issue with the inspections. Uh, they took they took a while, and you know it was sorted out, but. Is that something we might get into again in the next in the next year? Because if you're saying that, you know, and I've seen it from the Economic Strike Committee, that there's a, there is a lot of activity going on. Is I think, that something um, you'll get into again? I, I don't think we're going to get into that quite the way we saw. Most of that was happening during COVID. Yeah. Right. Everybody was home. Everybody needed extra room. Everybody wanted a swimming pool. Um, you know, unless we're under a lockdown situation again, I, I don't foresee that that type of scenario um, happening. And, and that was not just Southington either. That was right across the board. Um, we were doing our best. Everybody was doing their best to handle the influx of, of yeah. the work coming in. Okay, thanks. Well, I appreciate your input as well on the Public Works Committee. It You're does help us there. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. Appreciate you being here. Okay, let's let's we'll do the uh, library and Barnes Museum now. Now demonstrating his diversity and of management skills, Mr. Mark Shota, library director. You know he's he's still on probation. And he still does. And that. it's on page ninety four, followed immediately by the Barnes Museum. I believe on ninety six or ninety seven. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Director. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, as uh, acting director of the, uh, of the Scientum Public Library, I'm happy to pre present to you tonight several different things. First of all, uh, most of us are familiar with the library. The library is open six days a week. Uh, we handle a large amount of clientele. Uh, we have three different divisions. Uh, one is the children's division, one is the youth division, one is the adult division. Uh, our library is also open for several other reasons. We, we support uh, any kind of uh, tutoring whether it's tutoring through the Board of Education or whether it's private tutoring, we support that. Uh, we do have some areas which are less noisy than others, which we try and put the, uh, the tutors in. Uh, that being said, uh, some of the stuff that, uh, as we talked about, one of your things is what, what do we do that people don't know about? First of all, I must say, we also do notary. So mark that down, too. So the library does right. notary also. So there's plenty of places for notary. Um, but some of the stuff you probably don't know um, is that on a monthly basis, we do between 20 and 25 homebound visits. So um, if someone is not able to come to the library, we actually have staff who will take stuff to them. Uh, in the month of January, we had 22 visits, and we delivered 63 items for that. So that's something most people probably did not know. Uh, what you probably also don't know is that we're working very, very hard to get a bus mobile uh, in, in Southington. Uh, the Calendar House, as you know, gets uh, new buses almost on, on a yearly basis. Uh, when those buses go offline, uh, we're trying to see if we can get a bus uh, have it uh, have it decorated, take the stuff out, and actually make a, a, a bookmobile out of it. So in this particular case, that's something else that we're currently working on. And also something that you might know or might not know is that uh, you're able to get free museum passes through the library. So those are the three the things you probably don't know about. Some of the stuff that we're doing from a programming standpoint, uh, and I'll talk about our numbers in a second, uh, some of the stuff we're very proud of. We're working very closely with, with ARC, and we're working on, ne on neurodiverse programming. Now, what is that? Um, there, are, there are many uh, individuals with special needs who, when you walk into a library, it isn't, it isn't just going in there and saying, okay, I want this and this. There's, there's sensitivity issues, there's lighting issues, there's noise issues. So we have a program where we're, we're handling that. We work very closely with ARC on that. So that's something that we're also very, very proud of. Um, the library also led the way to get the town certified dementia-friendly. Uh, dementia-friendly being a program that uh, we work closely uh, with, the, uh, with the center here in Southington. And, uh, the library led the way for that. And also we have a nutrition programs which we run uh, on a monthly basis. 
That being said, um, when we talk about the children's, which is probably the most popular area that we have in the library, um, we had a uh, take your child to the library program, which we had 130 people show up for. I was there for that. It was, uh, uh, it was it, let's just put it this way, it was a little bit on the noisy side that day, but it was, uh, it was a lot of fun. Uh, we had uh, superheroes and princesses and all that. Uh, and also, um, one of the things we're most popular for is we run a, our own Comic-Con. Uh, you probably have ever watched The Big Bang Theory. Uh, we're not the one in San Diego, but we have our own Comic-Con, and that's going to be in, in June if you're looking for that. But we start working on that in February. So that being said, uh, I also have in front of you, uh, which is just for the month of February, the 65 programs that we run. Um, I left it in front. Uh, it's in, it's, yeah, there it is. Uh, there's, uh, not that you have to look at it right now, but something you want to look at later on. Uh, let me go through some of the numbers. And until I actually started working there in September, um, I worked in the town, what, 20 plus years, and I didn't realize the, uh, the numbers that we had going on in there. From a, from a, a standpoint of, the, of people going in and out, you would not know, because you go in there, it doesn't look like there's a lot of people going in and out of there. Um, but uh, the numbers tell the tale. Uh, we run, now this is, not, this is not our internet, this is just our hard stuff. This is whether it be adult, uh, juvenile, audio, video, others, which we have baking supplies, we have things like that. Um, we, we do about uh, 20, last month we did 20,357. Now we're open 26, uh, 26 days a month. So that's, that's things in circulation. Actually in, actually in the library stuff, not the stuff that you can go on your phone from yep. the Sunday Public Library, that's the actual physical stuff, Got it. which is 780 a day. So um, from, a, from a, a, a trans, uh, to transporting things in and out, that's, uh, that's pretty, uh, pretty big. Uh, that also includes what we call interdepartment library, which means if you can't find it there, um, another library in Connecticut will give it, will send it to our Southington Public Library. You can go and pick it up. That includes that too. But uh, that's it's a pretty big number. So that being said, um, that's what we currently are doing at the library. Uh, some of the big stuff we're working on now, the staff is the staff is working very very closely with the building committee. Uh, every Wednesday at 11 o'clock, we have a Zoom meeting with uh, the architect. Uh, the construction manager, some members of the building committee, and staff members, including myself. And um, we are now getting into the nitty-gritty about actual colors of tile, color, colors of carpet, uh, carpeting, colors of walls, things like that. So, But they've been involved from the beginning. The department hasn't been involved. So uh, I must say that um, although I'm, I am looking forward to having a, a full-time library director on staff, um, I did enjoy my time over there. And Rumor has it some of the staff enjoyed me being over there, so that's just a rumor. Um, now, from a budgetary standpoint, uh, you see that there's only really two areas uh, that I did increase, mainly because um, we, and I hate to blame everything on inflation, but um, our resources, I did bump up, which is the, where we buy our books and we buy all our materials. I did bump that up, uh, and I also bumped up the programming a little bit because the program is, is, is important for us. Now, this budget will not be with the new library. Remember, this budget will be starting July 1 and June 30th. The new library will not be online. This is for the, the current library we have. Except, uh, will there be any transition costs? Because if it's going to be built 2024, obviously, um, when, when, the migration, when will the migration any, happen? Any transition costs that are part of the building project are part of the building project. Part of the project. building project. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. This, is, this is designed just to operate the current library we have. Got it. And, um, we, I, I sat down with not only the public works director, but also the custodian at the library, and we're comfortable with the number uh, for maintenance. Um, but uh, let's just say that at any given time, uh, that could be an issue. But I think that uh, right now we're in good shape with, when it comes to the maintenance part of it. Can you speak to the referendum question that was voted on, how that affected everything? It's probably the reason why you were over there running the library. But beyond that, what, did, what was the net result of that? I'm not sure I understand the question. The question about the library, the management and leadership of the library. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. The I, referendum. I'm thinking, referendum. I'm thinking, of course, the building of the library. No, no, no. I'm no, sorry. the uh, the, rep, the referendum question. And I, and I think I think the reason why I'm over there is because the, the director wanted to do something different. I don't think it had anything to do with that. Um, but that being said, um, the referendum, in essence, what it did is it divided what exactly the uh, powers and duties are of each department. Uh, there was always questions from our charter from 1967 onward, there was always been questions on, on what happens with the library board, what happens with the manager. Um, I've always felt, and I'm sure uh, Gary and, and John before me felt that, when it comes to personnel, it's very difficult to have an appointed nine-member board handle 
things like discipline and all of that. They're, they're not trained for it, nor, nor should they have to worry about stuff like that. So I always felt that, uh, that the personnel aspect and more importantly the budget at, budgetary aspect should be with the administration and that's what happened. Everything else on the flip side, the voters uh, said uh, programs, what goes in there, what kind of programs, what books are, are shown, all that kind of stuff. That's the appointed members. That's the nine appointed members of the council who are the, with the library board. So I thought the demarcation was from the professional manager standpoint versus what policies, procedures, and books that the, that the community wants. We leave that to the appointed officials when it comes to the uh, administration of the, of the assets, including the building, the people, and the budget. That should be done professionally. How's it working out that uh, the, you know, the, the, the new structure and the differentiation between the library board and yourself? I, I, I've had a great relationship with the library board. Um, in fact, I've asked uh, three of them to be part of the, uh, the interview committee. Oh. Um, so we're working very well together. Uh, right now it's pretty easy because the acting director and the manager get along very, very well. So uh, we're leaving it at that. <laughs> and uh, uh, if there's no more questions for me, I do, I do want to introduce someone that I'm very excited about. Um, Christina had took, it took over the Barnes Museum and I was happy to be on her interview uh, for her also, uh, and uh, it's, let me put it honest with the, I've spoken to not only our previous library director, but the one before that, that we needed to, you know, to generate some, some income, generate some life into the Barnes Museum, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I do believe uh, we have found that person, so Christina Volpe will give the report on the Barnes Museum. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Town Manager and Mr. Director. Uh, I really <laughs> appreciate that. Uh, yeah, since I took over the Barnes Museum, it's been transformational, uh, this is such a um, vital resource for our town, and I think in a lot of ways, uh, a lot of those resources were laying dormant. And so since I've started, um, it's been my priority to not only uh, foster an environment where the community feels like they can come through our grounds at any time, uh, which we have been now calling them a micro park, right? The grounds of the Barnes Museum connect a neighborhood to downtown Southington. Um, it's ideas like that that have really been transformative for us, offering more annual programs as well. Um, our next one will be the Easter egg hunt. Last year we had about, Mark can tell you, he cut the ribbon for the Easter bunny. <laughs> um, he did not dress up, no. Um, we had about 200 children there that day, and it was like, snap, like they got their eggs and they were gone. Um, <laughs> Similarly, around Halloween, Layla Upson Barnes, uh, who lived in the home from 1910 until 1952, was born on Halloween and traditionally as a child had a Halloween birthday party. How cool is that? Um, and her future husband, Bradley Barnes, attended her party. Long story short, we now have an annual Halloween birthday bash. Our second annual one generated about 250 children. And we do try to um, join with members, partnerships in the community. Um, about three days a week, I work with Southington Stellar students to come down to the museum to do projects for us, ranging from digitizing photographs um, to writing articles. We have a young lady writing articles for us right now who, while she may have a disability, she is so eloquent and so passionate about this work. Um, so community engagement has been huge for me. Uh, I spoke to 45 second graders at Oceana Elementary School last month um, with our new history program um, called Hands On with History. I allow the students to come up and engage with artifacts from the museum, um, not goblets, so don't worry, um, but things like tops and roller skates and things that children of today, I know because I'm a mother to an 11-year-old, uh, don't really interact with. They'll never really get to see it, but yet we have it here. Uh, and one of the interesting things was relating it to local history. So at Southington Catholic, I also spoke to their second grade class there, um, and I brought a teapot that was made here in Southington in 1883. And I asked them, where do you like to go get cupcakes in town, right? Where can you go get cupcakes? And that's in Factory Square, and that's where the teapot was made. So it's creating and fostering those connections beyond just Bradley Barnes and what he did. Um, the museum is actually so much more than just this one family's history because, not unlike yourselves, that family was so integral in the decisions of our community. Um, and so we have a lot of industrialism papers, the last copies of the Southington Phoenix, things that need to be protected, digitized, and promoted. Um, so program-wise, in 2022, we delivered 20 programs. This ranges from uh, Know Your Antiques to our Christmas teas, which are a hit. Um, we also... Uh, have been safeguarding the collection, so repairing the Southington Phoenix, digitizing it, um, researching all uh, 1,500 goblets, 
I was able to connect with two other museums in the country and found out that we have the third largest collection of early American pressed glass goblets in the country, uh, second to the Corning Museum of Glass in New York and uh, the Valier Family Goblet Collection in Wisconsin. So that's a huge deal. Um, it's been a big part to promote it. I've been working with professors at various universities to see how we can go about cataloging it, promoting the collection, and generating visitors from that. Um, I could talk on and on, really. We do so much there. Um, we offer teas on the lawn now. But most importantly, um, this year, we will be focusing on connecting the collection to those histories. So, for example, this Thursday, I'm offering a program called History Pints, at which Dr. Brewing and Factory Square, uh, where I'll detail the entire history of Factory Square from 1857, when Eamon Bradley, who gave us the Barnes Museum in 1836, started the Southington Cutlery Company, all the way up until probably when we remember it still today, right, um, and its transition into an ad adaptive reuse mill building. Um, that's really exciting because that's where the teapot was made, so we're going to talk about that. And then in April, we'll be doing History Pints at Kinsman Brewing, and then we'll be doing another one date to be determined at the Historical Society. Partnerships are important to me. Um, so I'm sure I could go on and on, but if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. One of the things that um, when, when Christina took over that I, I kind of asked her to look at, and she's doing a good job on, is how do we get the Barnes Museum with grants and programs uh, to relieve uh, the pressure uh, currently on the taxpayers on it? Uh, now, nobody expects 100 percent, but uh, what are we doing to do that? And I know that we talk about that every, every uh, yeah. bi-weekly meetings every, every time. It's so ingrained um, to me, to uh, from my nonprofit background in history organizations, to seek out grant funding. So that transition never changed for me. Uh, we were granted in the 21-22 fiscal year a $10,000 community engagement grant from CT Humanities. And we were just recently awarded the same grant at $7,500. And that's just because COVID relief has decreased a bit. Um, so we did get over our asking, which was $5,000. And that enables things like our programs, which are so fundamental to what Mark is, is talking about. Um, other than that, we also got a grant to hire a fellow for the Goblet Collection. Um, and they researched the Goblet Collection for six months. And we're working on capital improvement grants as well. Because um, they're out there, you just have to be willing to sit down and, and write the grant, right? Uh, and I'm willing to do that. I have a question for you. Sure. Um, previous years, we have heard about the roof and the leakage. What has happened with that, and how are we building? The condition of the building is another story. We've had our hurdles since I've joined. Um, being an architectural historian makes it difficult to shy away from some of the issues uh, that the building does have, because without the building, you can't steward the artifacts, right? It's not enough just to put a roof over the artifact's head. You actually have to take care of them. Um, so we've addressed a couple of those things. The roof itself has, we have not had an issue. Uh, where issues have concerned is outdated uh, heating I would say is probably a good one. Uh, we had a concern about rodents, which is not, uh, you know, it's built in 1836. It's I like caviar to, to some of these. <laughs> exactly. So um, we've had an issue with that. Other structural things that I think just needed to be addressed, uh, such as, you know, new um, fire exit signs um, and, and things like that. And the gut, oh my gosh, the gutters, I'm so sorry. Um, we have a lot of gutters. I don't know if you've ever noticed. Uh, <laughs> so getting those cleaned can be quite a hurdle. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, obviously, obviously, the programming has, has, has gone way up, but um, what about actual visits? Do you still, um, has that, has that um, you know, gone up the same way? Yeah, so I count our program visits. Mm -hmm. um, so we've actually seen an increase of 108% oh. versus our pre-COVID numbers that, uh, as far as I can trace. On a weekly basis for house tours, we see anywhere between seven to 10 people on a weekly basis. Um, and on those special Saturdays we have programs, we sell out very quickly. Uh, our teas especially just like that, which is great. We're trying to figure out a way to add more. So I did two Valentine's Day teas at the museum, two Christmas teas this year. We're just trying to up the ante a little bit. And you keep the revenue from that for the, the museum itself? It goes... Um, does it go to... General fund. General fund. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Anything else for me? I hope to see some of you at the Barnes Museum. Please feel free to come by anytime. Or at one of the breweries. Oh, yes, or come to the brewery. 
History Pints on Thursday is History Pints is in small history, but also History Pints is in have a beer. Thank you very much. Have a beer. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thursday, right? Okay. Yeah. host an election night thing. We have elections coming up this next cycle. <laughs> okay. Moving right along here. Uh, we're, we're early according to the schedule, but I see our police department in back. Let's, As let's do it. We're ready. We're ready. Page 43 of the document. Oh, oh. Thank you, 43, Mr. 43, 44, 45. 45. What a nice... Jim, how are you? What the deputy chief is going to pass out is two different documents. First one being this one, which is the budget we submitted to the town manager. Um, you can read that at your leisure. And then the second document is a summary of where we are now it should be quick um, let's start with the emergency management budget that's page 50, 50 and 51 of your document that, that budget is being submitted without any increase from our current budget, our current fiscal year. You want to ask individual questions? Or you want me just go through it, and then if you have questions, you can ask. How do you? Well, I, I think you just go through it, okay. and then we'll yeah. we'll we'll ask questions. Everything's always, you know, nicely laid out. Okay. The next one is our okay. safety budget which is on pages 48 and 49. That's a 2.4% increase or $2,020. And that increase is due to the cost of the paint for the road, roadway markings. It'll be the same distance, same linear footage. But because the price of paint went up, does this, does this amount get the job done? Are we keeping up over year over year over year? Are we? We're consistent. I wouldn't say. <laughs> and then, like, when they redo roads, that's part of the road bid, and they paint those roads. So okay. in addition to the roads we do, it also covers all, like, the uh, trail crossings, crosswalks. So, um, so when a hot spot comes up, you may, this budget may get eaten up. It's uh, like you put in the, the trail crossings. That became a... Those do we do every year as needed. Um, so we're consistent. We do a certain mileage yep. each year. Should we be concerned, though, that we're not... We're consistent, but, you know, over a five-year period, we do we hit the whole town? Or do we have spots where we... We do the... the table? Well, tr more traveled roads, we do those, we keep those up to, up to date. Um, should we do more? Yeah, but money's tight. Yep. Okay. I understand that. The central dispatch budget on pages 52 to 54, um, that budget is being presented with a 2.5% increase or 24527 Um the only increases are our contractual wage increase of 16278 and the increase to the overtime to get us tw closer to the three-year running average. So that's, there's, there's not a lot of discretionary spending at all. Um, we did put in for... A uh, new dispatcher, but that didn't didn't make the cut. 
Next uh, budget is the animal control budget, pages 127 and 128. That's a 3.3% increase, which is $7,711. That included contractual salary increases of $3,249, uh, increase to the overtime of $500, the contractual longevity increase of $100, and the increase given to us through finance for the self-insurance increase, which was three thousand. <sighs> Sorry. Uh, self-insurance increase of three thousand eight hundred and sixty-two dollars. And the last budget is a police department budget on pages 43 to 47. Um, that saw an increase of 4.9 percent, or a total increase of $433,846. And <coughs> uh, we had we had more things in our initial proposal which were were cut and um, it in it includes that we're eliminating our middle school SRO pilot program that we were doing. Um, we're also going to have to look at calls for service. Um, and and the big uh, raises or the, the drivers of the increase are regular wages contractually with the settle, well, we have a settled contract. That's $192,331. Uh, five thousand four hundred uh, thirty-five dollars for an increase of a stipend, clothing allowance of eighteen hundred dollars, and then we were able to lower tuition reimbursement by three thousand dollars. Overtime, we increased it by a hundred and fifty thousand to bring us closer to the three-year average. Three-year average on overtime is five hundred and almost five hundred and eighty-five thousand uh, dollars. The Taser service plan went up twenty-nine thousand thirty-six dollars. Uh, we put in for furniture renovations, or well, our building's twenty years old. Our furniture's twenty years old, and it's it needs to begin a replacement plan. Um, there's quite a some starting to fall apart, so. We figured after 20 years we should start doing something to make the building and the, the furniture in the building. Those are things more like chairs and chairs, chairs. desks, uh, dividers. Uh, it it's spelled out in the section below it on that summary sheet. Workstations, desks, conference, our conference table, uh, ergodynamic dynamically. Correct desk chairs, guest chairs, and storage cabinets. That's uh, the list below. Um, new vehicles that increased by thirty-eight thousand five hundred and sixty-eight. We had put in for an extra one, but um, it's been reduced down to the four we get every year. But even that brought it up by thirty-eight thousand, based on the higher cost of the cruisers. So the same four. Higher same cost. four. Higher cost per vehicle. Um, we actually test bought a few Dodges, and the Dodges were less expensive. They were bigger. They the got the officers liked them better. They fit better in them, so they're actually cheaper than the Fords that we priced out. So we're going to go with the four uh, Dodges. Four more, more four. in addition to those test ones. Nope. Every year we, we've been okay. replacing four, so we're just staying on the same pattern of four. We could use more, but money's tight. A um, big driver is the gasoline, which we had to increase by 61500 based on the numbers we were given by uh, finance. And the energy lease is going up by six hundred and twenty-eight dollars. Just to Jack, just to ex uh, explain for the people who watch this, uh, gasoline and diesel, um, it isn't just a, a one-year increase uh, for the town. We are locked into a contract 
which was a fantastic contract. We were we were paying for gas and diesel. I think one dollar and thirty one cents for gas and one dollar and sixty seven cents for diesel. That was a three year contract, which is expiring June thirtieth. So therefore, now we have to in this budget we have to anticipate the new numbers, which are three sixteen and three whatever. So you got to figure there's two dollars a gallon more for diesel, two dollars a gallon more for gas. That's incorporated not in this budget, but you'll see tomorrow the big ones, fire department and public works also. So go ahead, Jeff. So reality hit. And we have to watch when we settle, when we actually hedge, when we lock in. Yep. We have to hope that that's lower by the time we get to that point because we're not locked in yet. No, the, we're anticipating, our, but right. not locked in. Our energy consultant doesn't want us to lock in right now. He says it's too, it's too volatile. Well, that's basically the only increases uh, we are at at this point. Um, some of the things that I, I think have to be taken into consideration is I have a very young department. Probably in the past three, four years, I lost 25% of my department. So I went from a very experienced department to a much younger department that needs training. Um, this, that's why I'll do the best with what is given to me, but that's, uh, an important part that has to be taken into consideration. My department is so young. All the supervisors are very young. They do a very good job, but we also have to teach them how to do the job. Um, FMLA, um, I'll give you an example. Over the next five months, I have five people going out having babies. Having a young department, they're young, married, and having kids. And I got one day when I had a baby, or I didn't have a baby when my wife had babies. We used to get one day. We're looking at one to two months of FMLA leave for each of those officers. So that's a very costly thing that we didn't have a few years ago that's really hurting our department. Another thing is the police accountability bill. Um, people pass things in Hartford and they don't take into consideration what it does to us here on a local level. Um, they mandate training, certain training. They mandate we be accredited, which are good things, but they should provide us with some money for that. Um, it's it's just policing isn't what policing was. I've been chief 20 years, um, been a cop 39. It's nothing like it was 39 years. It's nothing like it was when I started 20 years ago. It's nothing like it was three years ago. The field of policing has just totally changed, and it's it's scary. I think I believe we have to invest more in the police department, but. I don't have to deal with the things Mark has to deal with. I'm very one-sided. I think every should, thing should go to the police department, but, <laughs> but that's just me. I understand the decisions you have to make, but I think public safety is paramount. So that's all I had, unless you have any questions. Not a lot of increases in my budget. Aside from the, the money aspects, how is the town doing crime-wise? How is our police department <coughs> keeping up? What are we seeing happening? What's going on on the other side, not the non-money side? I, I believe this, this state needs to invest more in policing. Um, it's, I, I, they, like I said, they pass legislation that's passed on to the local level and we're struggling. Um, we used to, what we're, the reason we're surviving is that we have a great pension and we're able to, when we have a vacancy, we're able to fill it relatively quickly with a certified officer who's leaving another department. That's going to start changing now because people, other to towns are seeing what towns like us are doing and now they're offering $10,000 sign-on bonuses. So there's towns that have the same pension as us that'll give the guys ten thousand dollars to come there so it's it's a fight for all the best people it's you don't get as many candidates 
like I said, we're lucky because we're able to fill our vacancies immediately, but I worry about the future. And, and, and as far as we're busier than we ever were, um, we no longer, when I was a young cop, would send one or two officers on a call, take 10 minutes to get it straightened out, and you move on to the next call. Nowadays, with the paperwork that's necessary, the different uh, de-escalation requirements, it's just a whole different job. It takes longer. They don't have as much experience, so it might take them a little bit longer based on their um, youth and inexperience. It's, it's a challenge. So is it, is it the number of calls or the duration, like all the, it's the a, requirements of a call? It's a combination of everything. It's like every, what's happened in Connecticut, everything is taking more time, taking more officers. Um, we, we get more serious calls. That's where we're going to have to start looking at do we send call, uh, certain types of calls we're not going to handle anymore. Um, Southington's always been a full-service department, and we have to look at if we want to continue that. We, we came up with a plan where we were going to, we're probably between 8 and 12 officers understaffed where we should be. Um, we came up with a plan where we were going to replace one officer a year for the next five years trying to reduce the impact, and that's not happening. So I don't want us to dig a hole. Right. We're doing this town, economic development does phenomenal in this town, but... The services a police officer, the police offer, is is not keeping up, in my opinion. But like I said, I'm one-sided opinion. Actually, question more for for Mark. Um, yeah, I can understand, you know, the in, the increases here because you've, you've spelled it out very very well as to what what they are, you know, especially things like the gas. Um, the fire department only had an increase of 2.5. Is what, and, and they're under the same no, issues with no, the. They're, they're, <laughs> what, what's, what's the difference? There's no salary increases in there. Uh, okay. Yeah. Right. Got it. Yeah. Thank you. There's, 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 right. there, when when you just talked about the chief Thank with his million, was it 180 thousand in salary? Yeah. Uh, remember that contract is not. You probably read in the paper that contract hasn't been completed. Mm -hmm. So therefore, uh, there's no there's no salary increases. In there. Understood. Yeah. Is, you know, regarding the crime, is it? You see a lot in the paper about about crime. Do we really have a catch and release thing going on with with juveniles, or is is the court system and the prosecutors doing their part to keep crime down, or, or because we always we always see things that pop up on either social media, the press that says uh, the police caught somebody. They um, just recently a, a burglar in the basement of a house here in Southington. Press releases come out, and everybody says, "Great job, Southington Police! Wonderful." Behind that is the court system, the prosecutors. Are, are they all keeping up with it too, or are we seeing? I'm not going to stand up here and badmouth. Okay, no, no, prosecutor I mean, who who might be having to sign a warrant from yeah. one of my officers in the next. But is month. the whole thing working? All right, leave it. To I don't me. think it's working. No, nope, I can, okay. I will say that that oh. Connecticut needs help. I'm going to have to take them. <laughs> Just to clarify, I was a police officer 39 years. You were? Yeah, we were. <laughs> in, in Southington? Where? I know I'm going to take a beating on this. The public is not going to like it. But I have a, a deputy chief over there that well knows that, a great person, and got a reward for being a, a, a good, uh, good officer and doing things. But what bothers me the most is, as you just stated, Hartford passes certain things. You get officers that are tied up, sometimes three officers tied up in a the little juvenile situation. And it's got way out of hand. I, I, I mean, the other day, they called in a 209 uh, or 211, and they said, well, I'll call the police department. Well, actually, that's good, but no one shows up from social services. I'm not bad. I, I can say what I want to say. And that's the bottom line. The way things have changed and the dynamics of police work is way out there. And it's the fa they make Bill, it difficult. Billy always says it's the family dynamics of a breakdown. We had an officer who stopped a 
young person, had a ghost gun, had drugs on, in his car and everything, when the mother came down and bailed him out with a $150,000 bond, that's a bond we put on him, the mother said to the officer, well, I think the stop was illegal. So the officer looked at her and said, what about the fact that your son was carrying a gun? Mm-hmm. Oh, that, that's un, unimportant. So th- that's where things are breaking down. Family goes, so does society. There's a Pope and, John Paul II quote. And that's why it's not getting any better, and we need cops. I think it's more than that. From what I hear from some of the teachers at the high school and the staff at the high school, there are significantly more calls for emergency services at the high school for students that are out of control than there were in the past. And more ambulance and police services are being called to the, to the high school than any time in the past. Um, to the tune of this person told me where they used to have maybe one in a week, they could have three or four in a day now. And it's significant. We're the go-to place. Everyone calls us for help. So That's significant. And we go. And have to be cool. So thank you for your work. Thank you. The uh, statistics on, you know, obviously we had a huge problem with, um, you know, I mean, uh, it was mostly juveniles, I think at the time, uh, coming in and, you know, uh, ripping off cars and stuff. Um, has, that, uh, has that crime wave crested in town, or is it, is it just a... Uh, oh, it's... Know, it's still out. It has its peaks and... And valleys, yeah. Okay. So it's still something you have to be aware of. Yeah. And that's statewide. It's not just okay. Southington. Oh, it's not... Not gone. And we didn't have enough snow to slow them down either. <laughs> I know in the past, Chief, you've invited us and we've asked, um, sometimes we come in, we sit in your conference room and you go through deeper statistics. You have statistics on everything, yep. right? Statistics on overtime down to the code, every type of call, how long the duration of the call is. And we've participated, different members at different times. We'd like to do that again at some point when you have the availability. And I understand. I just, it takes time to get all this data together yep. so don't put us through having to get all this data together and then it falls on deaf ears because that's that's my fear we work hard to get the data to give everyone the information to justify everything we do and sometimes it seems like it, everything falls on deaf ears Sorry, I have to be honest. <laughs> but it does help us to get insight. I mean, it didn't fall on deaf ears when I, when I went, and I, I, there were other members with us, different meetings. It's, we do the same with the fire department, too, when they tell us what's going on. It gives us some insight behind the numbers. It doesn't necessarily, I mean, if deaf ears mean, you know, the budget didn't go up by 10%, it, it is. But it helps us just to understand what's, what we have going on and when the need for a new officer or two come along. We, we know some of the backstory and it helps us without having to you know reveal it on on tape on in the public in the public eye every every little thing that's going on and that wasn't meant to be an insult no. in any if I but I'm we, not I'm not as smooth as Bill I <laughs> but we know that you know we know that every we know you guys smooth probably every department <laughs> that comes here could could do more and right now if you if you look at this 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 budget for the first time in a long time, it's sitting here as it, as it comes with a 6% tax increase, 6% mill rate increase. And just trying to understand it, we were just talking before this meeting that the majority of it is inflation and another big chunk is the usage of health care because people hadn't been using elective procedures from, from uh, elective surgeries that they put off during COVID to just regular tests and um, preventative medicine. That's on the rise. So those are the two big drivers. So sadly, a budget that went up, the Board of Education budget up seven million. I have not, I only got this book tonight. I got it online, but overall spending up as much as it is for 
no increase, and I think that's the frustration you feel in others, no real increase in service. If somebody lived in Southington this year and they're going to live in Southington next year, they're going to pay 6% more in taxes, uh, again, Board of Ed up $7 million, and it's going to be the same. See, no it, new program, it, no thing in, special. With us, it's going to be less service. So that's what frustrates me because, and I don't blame the town of Southington. I am strongly saying that a lot of the, a lot of the drivers in my budget are the police accountability bill and the things that they require us to do, but yet they've given absolutely nothing to fund it. And I got a problem with that. But there's not much I can do about it, and I understand. I understand your uh, dilemmas, and I understand Mark and Jim what they have to go through. I get it. Don't like it, but I get it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Thank you. Thank you, buddy. Hey. So tomorrow night we have uh, whoever. Tomorrow night we have assessment, and tax collection. We have recreation, which is now youth services and senior services. Uh, the big ones, works. the big ones, public works and, and fire. Fire. Yep. Okay. Can I ask one one thing? Well, thank you. Everybody. We'll be around if anybody has a question or something. We'll be around for a few minutes afterwards. Or something. Anybody wants to chat? Vicky, could you imagine your Jim? father? Um, 